Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. It is a great pleasure to welcome you here to the ETH, the ETH Global Lecture, The Robots Are Coming. My name is Dr. Chris Lubkeman. I am head of foresight at the ETH in Zurich, and I will be your host today for this global lecture. This lecture series, the Our ETH, or ETH Global Lecture Series, is a platform for contemporary global topics to be discussed with outstanding global thinkers. And today we have two great global thinkers when it comes to the theme of robots and robotics. Every month we bring individuals together to discuss their personal thoughts, their insights, their experiences, and their expertise. In addition, in addition to simply learning, our goal for all of us here today is to broaden our perspectives of contemporary topics so that we can all broaden our thinking, challenge our own opinions, and through this, hopefully, make a meaningful contribution to issues which we are all thinking about, confronted with, and things we have to decide on. As you can see, we're not in our studio in Zurich, where we typically do this, but we're at the AI campus in Berlin. This event right now is part of the Berlin Science Week. And the Berlin Science Week is, an international, is a moment when Berlin invites the world's science community to come to Berlin to, and science-driven organizations to come to Berlin with a, sta with a staged, <laughs> oh man, Sunday morning. Sorry, we can cut that out eventually on the online. Sorry about that. <clears throat> a stage to share our insights on science and science and society on current topics and try to envision our future together. Throughout the 10 festival days and beyond, it fosters debates and knowledge exchange in an open and interdisciplinary spirit. And the ETH has been part of the Berlin Science Week since 2017. So... On to the topic, the robots are coming. Are they really? This is what we're going to be talking about this morning. First, we have Sami Hadidin. Sami is a leading figure and innovator in the interface between robots, robots, robotics, and machine intelligence. As a full professor at the TU, or Technische, Technische Universität of Munich, and a founding director of the Institute of Robotics and Machine Intelligence, one of his goals, as he says, is to bring safe, intuitive, and reliable robots into the world. Fantastic and welcome. Great nice to meet you. you. His discussion partner, also a great human, is Mark Pfeiffer, co-founder and CTO of Sia Search, and an ETH alum, which we're very happy to have him here, yes. Sia Search is a tool which allows all of us, or those in robotics, to easily select, manage, and control data for AI applications. And they're going to tell us a lot more about what they're doing in just a second. Our time together now is going to be about 54 more minutes. And it's going to go, we're going to have a conversation for about 20 of those minutes, just the three of us. And then I'm going to ask you, either online or here in the room, to pose questions to our guests. And then we're going to continue that dialogue between all of us. All right, so around the robots are coming. So, are we ready? You guys ready? You are ready? Sounds good. Excellent. So, first of all, what is a robot? Sammy, uh, what I is a robot? I thought you chose him. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're on the other end, so you're going to yeah. go. Great. Yeah, what's a robot? Um, there's probably many answers to that question, depending on who you ask, but I guess uh, uh, roughly what, what we all agree to is that um, a robot is an artificial machine uh, man built that uh, is able to act and interact in the real physical world that is able to um, learn um, execute decisions that is, has been reasoned about and uh, in particular is able to solve problems um, that uh, are of some meaning to, to humans I guess mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's roughly what a robot could be um, d defined as mm -hmm. and um, then obviously this means that a robot is not only a um, manufacturing system in the big automobile companies, but it's a robot that explores space. It's an mm -hmm. autonomous car as a robot, autonomous drones, everything that kind of 
moves and interacts and manipulates the world um, could be de uh, declared as a robot. And then obviously there's a huge continuum between artificial systems and then natural systems and then everything in between. And then you need to draw the line probably at some point. So what do we still mean uh, or want to de uh, determine to be a robot and what do we think rather of being an artificial biological system? So I think that's mm -hmm. another dimension in which this actually is. Okay, so the continuum, and you ended here on one extreme, the artificial biological systems, and the other end is something which perhaps does not learn, it just does. Or does a robot always have to learn? I think a robot, I mean, it would be a pretty basic robot if it does not learn. Oh, well, basic's okay. But yeah, I mean, let's, uh, let's call it, um, at least a little bit of learning would be great to call it a real robot. I mean, yeah. obviously there's the, let's say, um, the technological a development over the last almost uh, 80 years in robotics, in real-world robotics. Yeah. Um, and robots only recently learned to, to, um, to learn in the real world. Mm -hmm. But I think on the, on the basic, um, let's say, scientific level, we always wanted to achieve um, intelligent systems that are, that are able to learn indeed. So this does not only uh, tell us science fiction from diverse uh, angles, I mean, starting from Asimov mm -hmm. um, and ending up in... The, the implementations in the series we, we just uh, mm -hmm. uh, see nowadays, but I think we always have been dreaming of robots that are intelligent, meaning learning enabled, obviously. Okay. Yeah. So Mark, what about you? Do you, do you? do you concur with this definition? Do you want to add to it, add some, add some flavor to it? Yeah, I think it's uh, good, good, um, good to add something there. The, I think the, for, for me, I would say the, the biggest difference is basically between a robot, which is just like a mechanical device, and an, and an intelligent robot, which can actually take decisions in, in the real world and basically uh, react to what's happening in the real world. I would say like probably one of the most basic robots is like a coffee machine or something like this, where you just like press a button, it executes a task that like a human doesn't want to do, um, or like um, can be basically tasks that like humans don't want to do, or tasks that like humans cannot do, like in, in manufacturing is more mm -hmm. precise, in, in um, kind of medicine, biology might be like a human just cannot do it because you need to be like smaller or something like this. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's like a pretty pretty broad range of, of those those kinds of robots, um, and then, and then I think there's a basically the second category of like those intelligent robots. Mm -hmm. What you what you also mentioned, kind of the robots which are capable of learning, robots of uh, like being capable of interacting with the real world, which I think is like the also a bit like the topic topic for today. Like, are the robots coming? I think those are definitely the ones which are the the most challenging. Uh, right now that basically like you get this real world interaction kind of done in a way that is acceptable by by humans mm -hmm. i think that's the that's also the super interesting part why why i guess at least for me why i'm working uh, in this domain cool so i think that's a really good point because that this is what i wanted to for for us to kind of be able to put some boundaries on what we're going to be jumping into today sort of on that spectrum as you've already said well i really am only interested in things that r learn and you because when I think of robots, I also think of car factories and things like that. Uh, uh, like you said, so I think we're gonna we're gonna focus on that spectrum. And those are these these machines which learn to solve problems either autonomously, independently, or guided. And I'm gonna, you're gonna explain a little bit about that, I hope. So that's we agree on that. Okay. Maybe one thing to add there is really that uh, I mean I fully agree. I think that's that's the yep. exactly the future direction. At the same time, I think we should be aware that intelligence and, and learning does not always have to be in, an, in a you know, conscious, conscious level. It can be adaptation in the processes. So I think we all, and I guess we, we all agree in the robotics community, that uh, systems that can adapt via m rather the embodiment, for example, instead of this classical perceive, uh, plan and act loop, um, is also some form of intelligence rather than an embodied intelligence. And I think this is also something we should consider today because that's kind of coming closely with the rather algorithmic intelligence and the data-driven performance we see over the last year. So, so, so tell me more about that. Mark, you were kind of going, yeah, yeah, he's right. What, 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 tell me more about that. Help me understand what is it you really mean practically about that? So it's learning to walk, that you, so you, it's beyond the algorithm where things start to happen you don't understand? Or I mean, Tell me a little bit more. What do you mean? I mean, think about the human. I mean, we, we are kind of uh, intelligent machines, yes, but we are not automata in the, you know, Da Vinci sense that mm -hmm. we are simple p uh, pulley mechanisms that can move where we can kind of uh, just control the motion, but our body itself has 
a very, very strong sense of, you could call it intelligence, in the sense that it's the yang of the yin of the computational aspects of the human body, for example, our central nervous system. Mm -hmm. So we are not just a stone that you put a you know, PC on, and then you make the stone uh, walk Roll, intelligent, yeah. uh, intelligently or manipulate, but our soul body is designed for the purpose. So I think the design of the machine is also a, f a kind of manifestation embodiment of what the algorithms and the sense plan act loops can actually do with that body. I mean, uh, in some form, I think all of us can only, can only jump that high, but there's obviously um, athletes that can do this much better than we can mm -hmm. do it. And the same thing we see also in robots. I mean, the embodiment of the robot closely kind of gives you the, the boundary what you can do with it or what the robot itself can do. And this can also evolve over time, obviously. So, mm -hmm. I mean, humans grow, we train, we change our physiology. And in, in general, in biological systems, we see lots of these adaptive processes that are some form of intelligence, mm -hmm. right? Because they directly impact um, the way that these machines interact, um, and in this sense, biological machines interact and, and, and act in the world. So I think this is a very important aspect that in the classical mm -hmm. robotics kind of industry we have not seen so far. So mm -hmm. obviously in the car manufacturing examples, that's nothing that you would like to have because they love to have everything at the sub-millimeter spec down. So sure. adaptation and evolution is something that is counterintuitive for classical automation. But I think uh, in the modern interpretation of robotics and the one that is now more and more coming, um, and I think last year at, at the Falling Walls, uh, the uh, Metin City from, from, um, from, from Max Planck Institute and, and uh, Stuttgart uh, got the, the Breakthrough Award, right? So this was really about that kind of, of uh, mm -hmm. robotic systems. And I think that's extremely interesting because it, it opens up so a new perspective. So adaptive processes or essentially computational evolution? Some form of. So is this something you work in? Not no. really. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No. But you work, uh, you do a lot with love information. Because I'm thinking you were talking about sensing. So as, as we grow as humans, we... We learn as we go. We sense different information as our bodies change, et cetera, et cetera. So what, when you're talking about information and robotics, w help me understand why that matters. Yeah, I mean, there's probably also there two, two types of information. One also that, like Sami mentioned, kind of the whole evolution of the, of the robot, mm -hmm. of the mechanics, of like how we can actually build better systems that can jump higher and so on, right? We, we have there, like in robotics, the nice thing is we have this uh, compared to humans, we can just like change a robot and build it in a different way. Mm. So that's kind of one one piece of information I think is like super important to basically, yeah, have the experience from the real world. Like, how does a robot behave? Can we build it in a different way that it basically suits the specific use case that it's built for in in a better way? Mm -hmm. And then I think there's basically like the the other piece of information of like that's more the algorithmic part. So kind of given this, let's say, body in a way, um, how can I like best Move or how can I best interact um, for the like with the with the with the use case or um, what I what I'm supposed to do kind of mm -hmm. um, and I think that's then also like the very interesting kind of active active learning part or active improvement by by the robot like while interacting with the environment I basically collect collect data with this data I can basically have like a lot of cases something that went well something that went wrong and then basically I think that's also like one of the main challenges of building robots. To actually realize that, like what they what they did was wrong, mm. take this piece of information and then basically improve their actions and and get better over time, right? And don't be like the static device which is in a factory and it's like um, every single time the exact same motion. Mm -hmm. so just say, okay, when I do it like this, it goes wrong, so I have to do it in a different way, and then basically mm -hmm. kind of continuously adapt uh, the actions, which I think is like a super um, super important aspect for for robotics in the real world. So you just said we kind of triggered something. Said. To help them understand that they made a mistake, I'm thinking of with my kids when they were very, very young. At some point, they have to learn that some by either by doing or by experiencing or by being told that something's dangerous or hot or not. So, so when we think of that, where are we in the spectrum of the age of a human with robots and robotic robotic learning? Are they at like five year olds, ten year olds, teenagers? Because a teenager point, they're gonna start rebelling, right? Where are we in that age spectrum? I mean, I, I think the phew, that's hard to that's hard to compare because I think in, in in the end always like a robot is built for like a specific at least at the stage where we are right now mm -hmm. it's built for like a very specific use case right. Okay. I I want this robot to do that, and then like also compared to compared to a human where you can kind of 
um, use information from different kind of tasks that you're executing and also use it for others, mm -hmm. um, th that's basically very hard for, for robots. I think with robots, we see the problem that we start learning from scratch for like a lot of different use cases, mm -hmm. uh, which then obviously like takes um, takes longer than, than it should. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's... I think you probably always started like a z uh, minus two year old in a, in a way when you <laughs> when you start building building such a system, yeah. Yeah. Shall we what, you? what do you yeah, think? I, I mean, I must I must basically fully agree. I think we're still in this in the phase where we um, where we lose all the knowledge uh, over and over again, right? So there's the big question: How can we make l uh, robots learn from experience and not just you know lose it from science lab to science lab to science lab so that everybody has to start over? Mm. But um, I think wh where mm. we are, I think really mm. in, a, on a, in a good position is this basic technology, meaning, I mean, if we look at the sensors, we have certain sensors that are really, really working well. We have actuators that are really, really well. So on this basic core technology, one could argue in certain directions we are, you know, as the typical engineering approach, right? We try to understand the problem and then we optimize, 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 and then we finally find a solution that is maybe better than the original uh, biological mm -hmm. one, but for a special purpose, as you say, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I think the... Uh, kind of situation where we are at, at the moment is really can we build robots that are more general purpose than before mm -hmm. and can we build kind of this lifelong learning loop and infrastructure that then could enable these systems to to preserve what they have learned before and transfer from yesterday to tomorrow mm. and over tomorrow uh, and, and so on and so forth and, and really build a kind of um, in a, call it an encyclopedia of experience on which they can uh, build on and mm. then like like kids mm -hmm. uh, continue to grow and to learn. But I think if you look at it from a very specific point of view, let's say manipulation and locomotion is two of the main things we, we want to do in, in robotics. I think we can see that, that on this very isolated um, skills, there is already quite remarkable mm -hmm. results, right? I mean, we all of us know Boston Dynamics and what mm -hmm. they have been achieved. Achieving, um, which is remarkable, I think mm -hmm. it's amazing. Amazing, not only technology but also science, ranging back, f uh, to dating Probably. back to the 80s, right? Yeah. Um, and I think it's it's amazing what they have achieved. At the same time, obviously, there are still lots of tuning involved, of course, right? I mean, sure. but still, it's it's remarkable. And then on the manipulation, I think we can see that we are not yet there to kind of mimic a parkour athlete or jump high and, mm -hmm. and do salty and so on. On manipulation, we are really at the you know three, four, five year old, I think. Uh, maximum, um, and and then if it really comes to some specific skills, then I think you can really beat mm -hmm. to some extent even our skills as as, as yeah. adults. But this it's really a very niche skill mm -hmm. in the end. So you said something which made me think about the engineering of very specific elements versus the optimization of the system, because sometimes with a system you actually need suboptimal components so that the system's optimized. Absolutely. So where are we, if you in the research landscape, we think of the robots are coming with the focus on the elements versus the systems. And where do you two focus? On elements or systems? So I mean, me personally, I, I yeah. focus more on, on systems. That's also a bit like the, it was the motivation why I wanted to go from the, from the research to, to mm -hmm. the more like product focused world. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the, the struggle, like my opinion, I think that the, the struggle is that we are still like, not there yet with the like building products that work in the real world, and I think therefore we we also have to kind of focus still on the elements that we actually get like a one product for like a one one robot for like or one robotic product in a way for like one purpose and get this done in a way that it's socially accepted. Mm -hmm. I think basically only then when once we made this, then we can basically start thinking about the the whole system because otherwise like if we if we start with the whole system in the beginning, then I guess it would probably fail and then no one knows why right mm -hmm. so i think it, it, it makes sense to start with the with the elements and uh, okay. kind of the research component first sammy what about you well i mean since i'm i have the pleasure of being a scientist on one side and then mm. also having acted as an entrepreneur to some extent i could uh, do both uh, and that's why i chose not to you know be operational in a company so that i can still uh, focus on the rather basic stuff and I think w what I'm trying to do at least is uh, to have the system in mind, the future system, mm -hmm. with the current systems and the, the kind of in individual, um, let's say, uh, I, I'd rather call it skills that we want to build, right? So mm. to, to mm -hmm. really bring them to life and then uh, kind of play with this a little bit. Mm. And, and obviously there's the mm. always the limitation in technology as of today. But just to give you one example, 
Mm, I mean, just this year there was the, I mean, the Nobel Prize for for uh, for physiology and medicine was given for the sense of touch, right, in humans, the understanding yeah. of the sense of touch. Why? Because it's it's one of our most important senses, yeah. right? It has really vital uh, relevance, and uh, and what you know, our community and I, I had the, the the luck to play a little role there was driving over the last, let's say, 15 years was really. Um, giving robots a sense of touch, an artificial mm. sense of touch, that took quite some time to get this to a level that you could now say, and now we can build it into our systems, right? Mm -hmm. And give these systems new abilities. Yeah. And I think this kind of describes on an anecdotal, uh, anecdotic level what I'm trying to achieve there. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, that's really interesting. So, so tell me about where we are standing between robots in the lab with a controlled environment where you know the humidity, you know the wind, you know the safety parameters versus robots on the street, robots on the home. Where are we as far as that threshold coming out of the lab? Where do you where do you see that, Mark? Should I start? You go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it's it's a very interesting interesting phase we are in right now because it's like it's it's exactly this this phase of getting the robots out. Well, I think mm -hmm. kind of. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm not that old, but I think uh, like so so far we've seen a lot like kind of building robots again for like the specific purposes in like very controlled environments, as you mm -hmm. said, uh, which I think also there makes makes perfect sense because otherwise we we won't get anywhere. Sure. Um, and I think the the crucial difference is basically between between the lab and the real world is is more or less like the the long tail of events that can actually happen. So mm -hmm. with that, what I mean is basically in the lab you have it, everything can be perfectly controlled. Maybe you, you add a bit of variance to like some experiments and basically say, okay, I'll try to push the robot a bit and see what happens, right? But then a as soon as you put it out in the real world, like probably in the first two minutes, there will be something happening that yeah. you haven't like foreseen, Thought right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I, I worked a lot on like robot interacting with pedestrians in, in, in the real world. Mm -hmm. um, and basically then you have like the, the nice and, and fancy algorithms. It works super well in theory. It works super well in simulation. Then basically the first thing you, you, you put it out in, in the real world and then basically the, the first thing that happens is like a pedestrian standing in front of a robot and see like, okay, it, it can't it, it can like drive around me. And then basically, uh, of course, like in a reasonable human would just like make room for a robot as a, as it would as it would do for for another pedestrian. But because it's a robot, people start interacting in a super super weird way. Yeah. And there are like <laughs> thousands of those cases. I mean, sure. if you look into into autonomous driving, probably there is like right. a, a, yeah. a a ton of events that like is never foreseen, right? Sure. I think that's basically the, the the very interesting part we're in right now, kind of um, also dealing with this long tail o long tail. Um, of events, like also how Sami said it, like at the beginning we, we need to have systems that kind of continuously learn in order to be able to um, yeah. deal with this long tail of events. But what about, <coughs> excuse me, what about like in a control, because we're seeing in some countries, like in Japan, where we're starting to see robots in a controlled environment, no, out of the lab, but in a controlled environment, in hospitals or in care homes, so you have a more control, where you're not on the street, we're sort of like the Wild West, you yeah. know, like who knows what's going to happen. Berlin is even crazier, <laughs> but so, so what about that? So this is that's like the, the halfway house, or for you, how do you see that? The halfway house for the robot coming out of? Yeah, I, I mean, <coughs> in a, in a sense, I think it's, it's not only the halfway house; it's also the relation to what are the grand challenges of our society in current ages, right? <coughs> so I think what, where we are at the moment really is. Uh, if you go th via the sectors, I mean, in industry, we know there's lots of automation, at least in automobile mm -hmm. manufacturing, right? So it's about 20% automation. That so doesn't sound horribly much, but it's by far the most automated sector. <coughs> and then now in the pandemics, we can see a lot of robots in the background uh, working in logistics, for example. I mean, why do we get our packages from um, <coughs> Amazon so mm -hmm. nicely delivered, mm -hmm. right, from this one company that, okay, that you have you heard of? Yeah. Uh, and some other ones that are going to be created in Europe, of course, right, yes. to, to match that. Um, but I think we all know that this is something that really, you know, is, is empowered by robotics, right? Yeah. Smart robots that are in this logistic yeah. sectors, exactly. So, and then there is obviously um, something that was really inspiring for me uh, recently was obviously perseverance. Uh, so the, the the Mars landing, and then mm. now we're flying on Mars. I mean, come on, how amazing is that, right? And cool. it was so nice to see my kids at night. You know, they're still very small, and they they were watching that, and they were so fascinated by that, because uh, they have. I mean, we have some <coughs> robots not only at home but in the lab, and they they are allowed to play. And then they say, so why don't you bring? So to me, as a father, 
why don't you bring these robots to Mars? So I think this is super cool mm. that my kids now think robots is amazing, right? Yeah. So um, that's that's I think this you know the the level where we are at the moment, and then obviously in the in the medical sector and in the healthcare sector. Um, we've got huge potential not only, but we also have lots of installment already as of today. Mm -hmm. If you think about the biggest robotics companies in the world, you could argue that Amazon, uh, the, the company I was mentioning before is one, <coughs> then there is other big companies that are now entering. I mean, we just heard Elon Musk also announcing that he will build humanoid robots um, in two years, I think. That was quite a statement, so I'm, I'm really happy that he's so... <coughs> pushing this forward. But also autonomous driving is there next month, right? I know, I know. Let's not go this far. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what I'm trying to say is um, <coughs> the other things yeah. I was mentioning were the real world robots, yeah. right? And then at the same time, we also have robots in our homes already, right? right. We have lo lawnmowers, we have um, vacuum cleaners. There is also robots that can, uh, that can yeah. clean. Just, you know, the definition we had before. It's it's a varying environment. It's not mm -hmm. constant, right? It's not yeah. industry. It is it is the first step. Mm -hmm. I would say this is the first step. But if you mm -hmm. go to healthcare, then we are in quite a challenging environment. Yeah. Why? Not only because it's not the same environment that, that we were describing in the outside world, but think about the people who are involved there. I mean, they are much more vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. It's about our, our safety, our health. Mm -hmm. It's about you know, okay. diverse sets of people who are not trained in the robotics field yet, who are not trained in the AI field at all. Mm -hmm. So, and how can we make sure that they are able to use that technology? And then that's obviously a huge societal aspect that needs to be uh, respected sure. there. So people are very, very skeptical about, you know, using robots in healthcare. I mean, you were mentioning Japan. I think that they have a very different attitude to, to kind of, uh, how do you use robots? How, how do they feel about robots, right? Much more positive. And I think in, in Germany, I think that's now more or less true probably for, for whole Europe, we have seen a, an, an, an increase in acceptance in this technology the last 10 years. Um, the pandemics played a tremendous role in this. Why? Because we could see that on the healthcare sector, and especially in the care sector, we could not deliver the care to the people in need because of the separation, right? So um, I think there, you know, this concept of telerobotics, for example, mm -hmm. would be a tremendous help is this really an autonomous robot in the sense we were discussing before? Probably not. It's more a tool. It's an extension. But it's definitely robotic technology that can transit from being a purely, let's say, teleoperated assistive device for a doctor, maybe sitting you know, in one of the big cities, that's Berlin or Munich or in Zurich, and then delivering you know, diagnostics and intervention at some point to people who don't have naturally access yeah. to that technology. And I think this okay. is really where... That, that, that is not simpler or more complex, it's just a different animal compared to the robots in the wild as you were referring yeah. to. Cool. Just a quick pause. Questions either from you here uh, in the audience or online. And we, we have, if you're online, you're very welcome to <coughs> pop a question in to the chat because I see them, they're on the screen, and then I will then take them, integrate them into the conversation. I do have one more question before I turn to you, and then I'm expecting really great probing questions from the studio audience. Social acceptance. The robots are coming. We've seen science fiction movies de showing us various possible futures from truly benevolent and wonderful assistance, life assistance, to horror decimation through robots. When you think the robots are coming and social acceptance, where do you think we are with this threshold of acceptance and this vision of what the robots are or could be? Mark. Yeah, I guess I mean we we we're, we're getting there. I think the mm -hmm. um I don't. I, I'm not like too afraid with the whole. Okay, robots will will destroy mankind and so on. Where where you see kind of where we stand right now and what what robots can do and like how they're built. I think that's that's definitely like a lot of things happen in science fiction. I think that that's one of them. But I don't I don't see this like to be super super realistic. Um, but I think the the other component, like the whole social acceptance, um, is is super important because in the end, I think that's also probably would be interesting to hear Sami's perspective, like being like in between research and and also like industry there. But I think that's that's one of the main differences between research and industry because like in in research, um, a major part of robotics probably doesn't care too much about the the social acceptance, um, mm -hmm. not like 
probably not care about is the wrong world, uh, wrong word. Which is like it's not the main goal, right? The main goal is basically to 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 improve the to improve the state of the art, to make the robots better, which which makes like total sense, of course. But I think that the social acceptance component is basically the uh, the tr the tricky one because in the end, like being better than the state of the art doesn't doesn't make a, a robot like socially acceptable if it, if it gets stuck like if a vacuum cleaner gets stuck like every every ten seconds, it, it doesn't do like it much wrong, help, but it doesn't help, help right? right? So yeah. so that's that's also like with every with every robot that I'm using, if if I basically need like two roboticists who are coming like twice a day because the robot is stuck, it won't be accepted, right? right. Like that's that's basically what makes robotic products so hard that you basically need to pass this threshold of of acceptance where the where the human who like owns yeah. or who uses the robot actually thinks, okay, this robot adds value. Yeah. And and I don't basically have to get like the whole uh, robotics team of, of of ETH basically coming by like three times a day to fix it. Um, and the an the answer, the first thing is, have you turned it on and off yet? Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> turn it off, turn it back on, now it works, right? Uh, yeah, that's the, yeah. <laughs> the ancient. Sam, what about you? Social acceptance. Well, I mean, Mark was giving a great um, kind of very specific analysis of the whole uh, aspect. I mean, <coughs> in the end, I think I it's really one of our grand challenges. Mm -hmm. It's not only the technological challenge to achieve some goals and, you know, define missions in which sense we want to drive our our um, technology, but really to, to play back and forth with society because I think we, we need really need to make sure that the technology creates a value to society and they need to understand it also. Not only we as technologists think that's an amazing product and that's an amazing technology and everybody should use it, but making, I mean, the healthcare sector is a very good example. I mean, mm -hmm. you could really tell when you work with these people, um, I mean, they take your technology, if it doesn't work in the first five minutes, they just put it aside and say, okay, please come back whenever you're ready again. And that's an important job I have, so please mm -hmm. don't waste my time. Mm -hmm. And I, I really appreciate that that kind of honesty in, in this mm -hmm. whole field. Um, and why? Because they care about people. And I think that's one of the most important, um, mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, aspects or mm -hmm. let's say maybe reshifts we, we might be considering in, in robotics in general is really to put the human in the center of what we want to achieve. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you remember the, the whole space program uh, in the US and the space race with, with uh, the USSR back then, then you could really tell that the, the huge engagement of, of not only the US citizens, but the, the globe as a, as a community was really when it was all about astronauts, right? It was not only about developing technology and satellite systems and all the wonderful things that we can benefit from today, but really when, when people were engaged and they could really free all the huge investments of an, of an entire country um, to, to this kind of big mission was really when it was all about the human in the, in the center of this technology and of this race. Yeah. It was really about, you know, creating a better future. And we don't want to de design a future where humans are not in the center, right? Yeah. So that's the main objective. It's <laughs> Yeah, but that well, sounds sounds yeah. like a trivial statement. No, but I think for for technologists and scientists, it's not necessarily the, the the everyday business that we do, sure, right? And bring this into the way that we do science and technology and translation, mm -hmm. that could be a, a game changer. I think yeah. also for the acceptance of robotics. No, I think that's really I, I, that's a really good point. I, I I take that on board and say, even go a little bit farther and say, not just humans at the center, but say, the whole global ecosystems at the center. So. It's not just about people, Absolutely. but other things as well. So uh, questions in the room. Any, anyone have a question in the room? There is a question that came online, which are there any robots here on site that we can take a look at? Um, so they'd love to see one. I'm going, well, um, all right, are both of you? Hold on, let me see, are you? Okay, no, he's human, all right. So, uh, that's, uh, so I don't think we have any heat right on stage, but so the answer to that one's question is no. So questions here. There's one up here, front. Thank you. That's all right. <laughs> Good. Thanks very much for um, sharing your thoughts and insights. Uh, quite educational. Um, so imagine the robots are coming. Don't we, what do you think? Don't we open up a, a, a flank in society? Don't we become vulnerable to, um, say, uh, for example, a huge power out? If robots take over critical aspects that, mm. that hold our society together, healthcare, certain production uh, lines, uh, uh, tasks we don't want to do as humans. So, and uh, to which degree do you see uh, we, we create a vulnerability, a new one, mm. um, by introducing masses, mm. ma uh, massive uh, robot laborers uh, in the various uh, places? 
Interesting like question. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Want to go first? What do you prefer? <laughs> <laughs> you go first. I like oh. that. Up, see, uh, give each a little bit of time to uh, think about <laughs> exactly. that. Uh, We're pros in that. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's very clever. No, it's actually a pretty good question, I must say. Um, yeah. So let me let me try to... I'm not sure I can answer. I can just comment on it because it's a pretty, you know big thing to ask for such a short amount of time, right, that we have here. Um, <laughs> oh, come on, Sammy. No, <laughs> the, the thing you're stalling, you're no, no, stalling. I'm not stall no, no, seriously. So yeah. I think this, because it really depends on how do we want to, to, uh, to kind of invest into that. So look at the pandemics. I mean, we could really see that in the pandemics, and now with the, you know, the supply chain problems we have at the moment globally, um, automation, logistics, and so on, are actually factors of resilience mm -hmm. for our society. So, I mean, just take, you know, do I have one? Yes, I was actually, you know, the production of these was really one of our biggest problems in Germany in the beginning of the pandemics. So we couldn't, you know, switch on a production side to really, you know, get this running. And I think this is mm. our current society. I mean, we are a technology dependent mm. uh, globe, I would even say, right? Mm. This is not a new factor. I think it's it's anyways the case already. So we are in a phase as a, as a modern, you know, in the... In the age of, of humans, of, uh, of technology, we are in a phase of mutual dependence of, uh, of uh, humans and technology. And we obviously need to design it like a system such that it becomes not a, a kind of um, a system that can be easily um, brought into, into colla collapse, obviously, but really as resilient as possible. And there's obviously lots of uh, engineering methods to really design that. Uh, kind of kind of technology, and I think this is really what what is kind of the back and forth that we need to take into into consideration if we design these these technology dependent societies. I mean, in a way, obviously, critical decisions should always be taken by humans. I mean, I think this is anyways already the case. There is now a law for autonomous driving in Germany that basically says the human has to be you know in the final saying if something goes wrong. Uh, in the healthcare system, I think the question is, what kind of healthcare system do we want to have? I mean, in the end, it's about delivering a service to humans. And if that service to humans cannot be delivered by our current technology, we as a responsible society should make sure that we develop the right technology to really bring that service to, to people, right? And I think this is part of increasing resilience and increasing quality of, of life of humans. And if technology plays mm -hmm. the pivotal role there, then we should obviously go for it. At the same time, making sure that the, the kind of this service is not depending on single critical failures in supply chains yeah. in whatever kind of okay. decision processes, right? So it's just embedding resilience. Absolutely. I'm going to summarize that into two words: in, embedded resilience. Yeah, which is again a big word, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. We can unpack that for yeah. a long time. So, yep. do you want to add something, or should I add another question? Yeah, just like I think I think it's a, embedding resilience is a good good summary. But I think the the other is then basically like risk assessment or a risk versus value assessment, right? Just just like a, there's always a risk with with everything that we do somehow. I think there's also no perfect system. I mean, every system will at some point fail. I think then is basically one is kind of building the system in a way that the, this kind of probability is reduced, and the other is basically just like kind of assessing which which risks uh, are we kind of willing willing to take, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. So whoever's uh, doing this chat, the questions you need to scroll so I can see more of the questions because it's. I, I think there's. I think I'm hoping there's more than there's been unless there's nothing else. That's it. Okay. So I I there's a question here, and then I've got another one for you. Thanks for uh, the dialogue here. Um, one question is, why do you think it is that most of the robots we build are somewhat like des designed in a way that they solve the task in a similar way that the human would solve it instead of kind of like thinking about the problem like bottom up and thinking about why don't we build like a robot that just lo solves the problem in, in a way that's like most efficient for the robot. Hmm. Um, and I think like that that's probably like the downfall, like it, at least in my impression of like many many robots that we see today and like do you do you see that changing at any point going forward yeah that's an interesting question there's another question right here let's get to both of them right yeah yeah hi um from my side taking on the the medical um robots discussion a little bit do you think that our laws are fit for robots coming in or do we also need to change our regulatory environment in that setting um i, I feel like we want to build robots are pretty capable doing stuff like humans do, 
but no human would ever be certified under a medical device regulation because they're just way too crappy for certain things. So I have the feeling we, we on the mm. one hand, we want to build stuff that is super reliable and, and, and precise. On the other hand, we want to give them capabilities of humans who do fail, but are very flexible. And are we have, do okay. we have a situation where the regulation at the moment expects something from our technology that we just can't deliver, being super adaptable, but 100% correct, which at the same time seems difficult to do. Okay, we've got two, and I think there's a third question right here. We're gonna get, since you're right there, go ahead and grab that question too. Okay, so just, uh, first, uh, I'm at next one. Uh, well, could you go ahead and give your question, and we're going to take all three. Yeah. Uh, actually, I think uh, for my side, uh, short. I I stay. I'm a cultural person. I stay in Berlin five years, but uh, recent three years, my work related uh, robotic uh, between the China robotic big robotic product and in the European. Uh, I think the question is about healthcare. Actually, I just two questions. First is for the. Robotic is not only robot, robotic should be related to emotion of the human. This is Professor talking. This is one of the projects we are making now. It's a robotic how to work with all the people at home because this is a main point or it's, it's difficult as a data system to talk with the people. Robotic is not enough. How to first, I think even the Germany, a lot of all the people at home, how to the first, uh, I just describe it better, I think, for my side. This robot first uh, can be the remind the older people the time to take your tablet. Mm -hmm. This is kind. Second is even your daughter want to send a messenger to your the old father, mother, okay, send a messenger. But the robotic for my side, the most important we make is robotic same as the emotion. We are making now the robotic can be the dance, with the sad, close air, give the people the hug. So this is a kind of the, you're talking about a robot should be give the emotion to people right. where are you uh, to fear the love of the all the people around him. So, so what's your so what's your, the question exactly? Uh, I just also want to ask the the, 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 the professor how you think about uh, you can be the more deep talking about your society with a robotic and the human re emotion. I just want to know what you think about this mm -hmm. part. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we got three questions. Are the laws fit for purpose, emotional connection for robots, and how come we keep making robots like people? Why don't we let them be their own things? Which one do you want to answer? I can go on the, the last one. Okay, go for mm -hmm. it. I think uh, I mean it's it's a it's a it's a very very good question. Um, I'm also like not a big fan of building robots actually in a way that they they do things as, as humans do it. I think there's a we always have to see. So at least like me personally, I see a robot more like a system that like augments the human, right? Mm -hmm. um, so basically, the, the human is like very good at certain things. It's like uh, probably more like on the on the emotional side and also kind of dealing with people. I think that's also what makes the the whole. Um, kind of robotics in, in care, like very, very challenging, right? Um, but I think the, the the main goal of the robot should always be kind of, you think about like the mm. what the robot should do and then basically build the robot in, because as we discussed before, right, with the robot, you have the chance to actually design it in a way that is more or less like ideal for what you want to do. Um, I think the, the, the tricky part there is basically that it might be easier for, for the society to accept robots when they do it in a, in a similar way as, as a human would do it because then it's like easier to relate to it but I think on the other side it also might be like a bit more more frightening let's let's pick like Boston Dynamics when like a, there's a humanoid robot it's probably more frightening than a robot on wheels right mm -hmm. so I think that that's like a bit like a two-sided two-sided sword but I think in the end uh, the robot should always be designed in the way that it's like optimal for the for the use case and probably like a I don't know like a Cooking robot doesn't have to cook with arms, but it can can cook in a like much different way. Um, mm -hmm. As long as the food comes out, it's it's yeah. it's good enough, right? Yeah. Mm. So I, I'm going to take a, the prerogative for a moment to share it. I think that's a really great question as well, if you don't mind. Because if I think back to the work at Hiroshi Ishii about 25 years ago at the media lab, because he was also at that point trying to understand how to create that emotional connection, so that you had this digital augmentation. Right, and this is to me. This is a little, a bit of how we're augmenting versus replacing. 
like if there's an augmentation, this this hug, or just this this augmenting the, your memory to say, hey, you need to take the pill now, or you need to go to the bathroom, or hey, I love you, and from the other side of the world. And that's that that human connection. I think it's a really important thing. So the one's not so we get away from the fear of, and this is a connectivity. So. And you keep, you came back to this like to, to the u, this use case, and what and I'm trying to in my own mind differentiate between the use case and the augmentation because I don't see those as being the same, right? And or, or are they? Well, I mean, <clears throat> I guess in a way, the augmentation is determined, the specific augmentation is determined by the use case and vice versa. In a way, technology mm -hmm. that is well designed for humans always ag augments our abilities and capabilities. Mm -hmm. So I think that should be, that's what I meant basically before with the human in the center, right? So what mm -hmm. what's the purpose? And augmentation is a very human-centric concept, because at, at least if you say yeah, just, it's I, augmenting I, yeah, humans, right? Yeah. The question is whether you want this particular augmentation. Mm -hmm. But maybe to, to, to kind of give you an example that I think maybe clarifies a little bit at least my personal philosophy about this whole concept is really, and it relates to the first question, um, which was about why do we build robots that uh, that kind of mimic, let's say, biology, right? Not mm -hmm. only humans, but biology. Um, I think the most successful robots in out there are exactly not like that, right? So they are in the in the research labs. We care care a lot about the human, and you know, this this old dream of you know. Dating back to the Da Vinci and, and the Golem and, and you know the, this very ancient idea of creating some artificial entity mm. that has human-like capabilities is a long-standing dream with diverse kind of kind of uh, uh, desires and, and and fears and hopes of humans. So I think that's one thing. Mm. But if you go to reality and if you go into products that really deliver some you know real-world value to our society, let them be on Mars to explore or let them be in let's say in the surgical room to augment the surgeon to be able to deliver a minimally invasive surgical procedure, I think that's a very, very technical approach, right? And cars are also something extremely technical, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, the wheel was not really there. One couldn't argue that human locomotion has wheel type uh, abilities, but that's a different story. So I think the things that we use most are this augmenting kind of things. And mm -hmm. then by definition, it's not a mimicry or not a co copy of the human right. because it's supposed to augment us, right? right? So I think that's kind of how I see roughly mm -hmm. the, the, let's say, the, the dimension between mm -hmm. research and then application. And then coming to the, to the personal care aspect, really. Um, so what we have been doing over the last years in, in a city in, in, in Munich that is called Garmisch-Partenkirchen. So it's kind of this, uh, this very beautiful, picturesque um, part that, that is in the mountains of, of Germany. Um, and it has a very peculiar um, demographic um, distribution. So it basically has the, right, the, the same distribution as, as Germany will have in 20 years. So hmm. many elderly people, but very good healthcare system, um, training of, of healthcare uh, um, workers, there's the clinics, there's also um, kind of very strong engagement for elderly in general. And uh, in, in, in Munich, we have been um, developing their uh, uh, research center that solely does not want to take the classical approach of saying basic research, applied, translation, studies and so on, but really in the beginning of everything, so really in the long-term mission to involve the stakeholders, meaning the elderly people, meaning the healthcare workers, the, also the, the, you know, the, the, uh, there's lots of families involved that, that really want to drive their technology, that c give, deliver care to, to, to elderly, and really have them involved in the development process as early as possible. And the idea of this is really to understand the questions that you are posing, not by answering them on a purely, you know, abstract scientific mm -hmm. level, but to get really people involved and understand what kind of technology do they really want, can they use it, and how can we improve the usage of it. Yeah. And this is something that I personally think is exactly what we should do. Why? Not because it's easy, but because it's much harder in a way that mm. it really makes it extremely challenging to deliver these uh, these mm -hmm. requirements, right? Because humans are very critical, especially with things that they have never seen before, and there's lots of kind of barriers in between. But just to give you one example, we are develop yeah, developing. Yeah, yeah, rapid. Yeah. Short, yeah, yeah. Sorry, but I think that's that's a that's a big topic. So it needs a little. No, it's bit a great of, it's yeah. a great project. I can't wait to hear, but we're running out of time. So it's just because because yeah. she was asking about the the the, the feelings, right? Yeah. So it's a big question. So um, what I'm trying to say here is really that the what what we what we want to 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 deliver there is really technology that increases autonomy 
in mm. by augmenting humans yeah, to live true. autonomously and not substitute feelings not deliver feelings to from robots to humans but to augment humans to be autonomous yes. and this involves also to be able to connect humans that are distantly you know separated from each other and use robotic technology rather as a channel of connecting them like the zooms and the teams and so on to give audiovisual communication yeah. instead using the robots to be basically the avatar of the doctor of the you know the mm -hmm. kid that can hug basically yeah. the elderly and this kind of connects to i just saw one question there to the metaverse right so i think in reality robotic technology for tele you know uh, um, uh, tele robotic technology is in some form going to the metaverse and then re to reality again, right? So it's much, much further than just connecting us in a digital world, it's connecting us in the physical world. And I think this is what robotic technology should do. It should not deliver, you know, false uh, feelings. Uh, it should re rather give us the ability to really closely interact. And that's, I think, roughly where, where we're at least trying to, to go. Very, very okay. hands-on. Yeah. Seriously, thank you. Stop that's really fantastic. No, the other question was, and a really short answer, Laws that are fit for purpose. Do you feel are we are we close? Are we not close? Do we is, there, is that a whole new area of research or development or do you have an, do you have an opinion? No, it can be an answer too. I don't know. <laughs> Probably the answer. I, I don't really I don't really want to deal with it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but I think it's 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 yeah. it's probably not. Uh, I mean, we're probably not not there yet, right? I mean, every every system somehow needs to be needs to be certified. We need to kind of grow grow yeah. with that, like with the new technology. Uh, probably like on the um, legislatory side, things could be always quicker. Um, yeah. Okay, like I mean, we're not lawyers. No, so fortunately not. Sorry. <laughs> Good question. Can't answer. Sorry. Um, I do have a, a very, and this is a big question in the last two may, minutes. May I say one thing? Because to be sure honest, I welcome. think it's actually more important than, than maybe we are kind of implying here. So if there is no laws and no regulations, there's no robots in reality. There might be robots in space and underwater and on, you know, in environments in the world where humans are not present. But the problem is because of liability. Yeah. Companies yeah. cannot go to market if they cannot calculate liability, full yeah. stop, right? There's zero way that you can calculate the business case without knowing that. Yeah. And this is also a yeah. tremendous reason why in, in, I mean, for safety critical applications, you were, you were referring to, to medical applications, surgical and so on. So that's a safety critical application. And if you go safety critical, such as autonomous driving, you need a law. And I think this is why sure. this law for autonomous that's driving was so important. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I didn't mean to dismiss it at all. I mean, it just, it's beyond the scope of our last three minutes. So, one of the questions which I had hoped we could get to or not, is the role of robotics, robots, robots, in looking and solving some of our grand challenges like climate change. 30 second answer, Mark. Well, I think, I mean, in the end, <laughs> that's, that's hard for 30 seconds. I think the short summary is I think a sing single robot won't, won't solve the grand challenges, right? But I think the kind of te technology as a whole, like what we can do with robots going to like uh, doing like clean up tasks in, in, in the ocean or something like this, observing certain parts of the world in a certain way, or basically going into areas which are just like too dangerous for humans for like Catas mm -hmm. catastrophic, catastrophic. catastrophic response. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I think that's basically kind of hu huge value add. Um, also back to the, the whole augmentation thing again. So I think mm -hmm. not, not a single robot, but I think technology and robotics as a whole can definitely add significant value there. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's maybe Jan, 40 seconds. Yes? Yes, and uh, I think we can uh, use robotic technology to really um, build online digital twins of the world, basically. So to really give us the right information to plan right interventions. So we need to, yeah. it's a global problem, so we need a global information system that really is able to give us the right information. So the global weather forecast for environmental challenges, I guess. So, and that leaves, that's sort of the, the, the difference between right data, big data, smart, small data, smart data. This is your world that you deal a lot with. Are we getting better? Are we not getting better? Just again, a thirty-second answer on 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 that. Yeah, I think definitely getting better. I mean, we we started working in this this domain um, three years ago, roughly. I think there, like the awareness was not that much there. Everyone talked about big data. Let's just like throw big data at it. I think now there's like much more awareness that we have to carefully select the data, like how we train the systems, how we test the systems, in order to actually solve what we also talked about is long tail of events. Mm -hmm. um, so I think definitely like the, it's going in the right direction. The, the awareness for, for this is rising. So 
I think that's now, good. Is there a lot of interoperability between the the different communities who are focused on robotics? Because you mentioned before, it's a very early part learning that robots will need to learn so they can pass on an experience. But you can't do that if you don't have a way to pass it on. We do it through storytelling as humans. So this requires data and algorithms to do that. Where are we with this? One of you. The beginning. Okay. So when the robots are going to really arrive, the robots are on their way. This is what it sounds like we've heard today. They're on their way. They're still toddling. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they are going to be here in the not too distant future. And they're already a part of our lives. I think this is the one thing which um, it's always to remind us that they are here. They're not just they're coming, they are here. Right? And this is, I think, for all of us to be aware that they are here. And now what? And how what? How can we guide? As with any toddler, they need to learn and need to have individuals helping them. And I'm very glad that both of you are helping those little toddlers. The to I'm trying to imagine a little toddler robot, you know, <laughs> going to grow up, and then we go. Sammy and Mark, thank you for sharing your passion, clearly, your wisdom, and, um, yeah, your vision on where things are heading. And I think I wish you all the best of success with this and then all of us. So let us give them a round of applause to say thank you. <laughs> really, really fantastic. And I would like to thank all of you who have joined us here on this Sunday morning at the Berlin Science Week. And um, it's great to those online. And thank you for your questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of them. I think we could keep talking for another hour and a half. And for those who are here, we can continue the conversation for a bit. But those not, it will all be online and recorded, and you're very welcome to continue there. So our next global lecture will be on the 18th of November with the research specialist from MIT, Kate Darling. And um, it's going to be a really exciting chat. I can't wait for that. I do hope all of you will join us online for this. And now, those who are here, you're welcome to join us for coffee. And um, thank you very, very much. It's all right. Thanks. Thank and it's a wrap. <laughs> We're